Hello and welcome to Russians with Attitude. Today we are joined by Nikolai, an author of videos from Mariupol YouTube blog. He was the, the first hand witness of the Russian conquest of the city of Mariupol in the early spring of uh, 2022. Hello, Nikolai. Hello. And as uh, always, I am also Nikolai, and my co-host is <laughs> Kirill, who can yes. now make a wish uh, if he would sit between us virtually. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so, Kole, we're very interested in your personal account of uh, your biography and life in the first uh, Ukrainian Mariupol, then the transitionary period, the Battle of Mariupol, and what is it like uh, to live in the Russian Mariupol these days? Of course, you told uh, people about it extensively on your YouTube, but maybe we will ask you some unique questions. I hope that we will. And our listeners demanded our interview with you to happen for a long time now. And actually, we are now doing it. So this is great. And uh, let's start with the very beginning, early life section. Uh, for some unknown reason, there is not a Wikipedia page yet about you. So <laughs> let's create it on this podcast. Uh, I take it you were born in the early 2000s right? In the beautiful seaside city of Mariupol. Uh, no, actually not. I was born in, in Donetsk in okay. 2005, and I lived there till 2014 events. Mm -hmm. I see. So why did your parents and you uh, move to Mariupol? In 2014, the uh, first war started. I don't know if it's a war or let's say battle. Yeah. We, we were in Berdyansk, uh, but uh, then our friends offered us an apartment in Mariupol uh, for a very cheap price. So we moved to Mariupol. Also, my dad was a metallurgist. Mariupol had uh, steel plants, so he had work in Mariupol. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the factory jobs were plenty in Mariupol. Interesting. And uh, your parents sold uh, the apartment in Donetsk? No, I still has uh, the apartment in Donetsk. I see. All right. Yeah, the, the prices on real estate is also an interesting topic to discuss, <laughs> but maybe we will do it later. Still, you were uh, living in uh, Mariupol for a decade now. And uh, when you arrived there, it was under Ukrainian jurisdiction and you went to the Ukrainian school and we were watching Ukrainian TV channels and whatnot. Did you feel that the society in Mariupol is shifting into some new direction compared to the childhood of your parents in the Donbass, for example? It's hard to say because most of people are neutral and as always, and most of people are don't care about all of this politics, sure. especially at that time back then, most of people were really aside from this. Yeah, a political, just like in Russia, yeah, it's a yes. common curse. But still, uh, the, the language question, uh, for example, I take it, it was all the education in the school was done in the Ukrainian language, right? Mm, not really. Uh, before oh. 2021, uh, language law was accepted in 2021. And before mm -hmm. it, uh, we had uh, two types of schools, Russians and Ukrainians. And I studied in Russian language school. But uh, later, Russian language schools were just turned to Ukrainian. So the situation has gotten significantly worse when Zelensky took office. Okay, and what about the TV? Was it also duolingual or bilingual or was it mostly in Ukrainian and various entertainment? My family didn't watch TV, but it was completely in Ukrainian. Uh, before 2014, we had uh, Russian channels and many like my grandparents watching them uh, but after 2014 ukraine just uh, disabled all russian channels yeah well um got uh, handed to the ukrainian tv it was pretty powerful entertainment business was always very strong and that's why i guess uh, people were not really bored without the Russian TV, because there's a lot of things, Quartal 95 and lots of series and uh, whatnot. Yeah, the X factor or whatever. Uh, okay, so on the streets, was there any division between the Russian speakers and the Ukrainians? Mm, there was never any division because in Mariupol no one spoke Ukrainian ever. In Donetsk, some 
very few old people are speaking Ukrainian or more like Surgic, like the mix yeah. between Russian and Ukrainian. But in Mariupol, I never heard uh, Ukrainian language. The exception is like uh, in schools and in official places and after language law. Uh, but I never heard it on streets in Mariupol. Yeah, despite the half of the schools being the Ukrainian from t- uh, 2014. So let's jump to uh, into the year of 2014, when the city of Mariupol was on the cusp of being taken by the militia, by the DPR. But it wasn't. And since then, uh, various nationalist volunteer battalions from the Ukraine made Mariupol their base of operations. And one of the most prominent such battalions was Azov. Uh, what was the atmosphere back then, and how did people react to it, to uh, the whole situation in 2014? I was a child, and I don't really remember, but uh, from many people who, who were adult at that moment, I heard that uh, Azov and SBU, uh, ser- Security Service of Ukraine, made many uh, people just disappear, many pro-Russian people, many activists who rebelled against Ukraine. And uh, Azov terrorized uh, people in some places like you know the library you heard about it Mm -hmm. yes the secret prison yes pre-2022 Mariupol there were a lot of ads uh, like conscription ads and military uh, like recruitment offices uh, headed by Azov to recruit people to fight in the Donbass was there any militaristic uh, wipes uh, before the SMO even began Uh, Yes, uh, since 2014, uh, we had like propaganda lessons in school and military, like soldiers of armed forces of Ukraine often visited us. And uh, it was propaganda and also military parades every year in a day when Mariupol was occupied by Ukraine in 2014. And since that, uh, every year we had a parade in that day. Well, our guest just referred to the library in Mariupol, and I think uh, some of our listeners may not know what that is. Um, The library was the nickname given to the secret prison, which was run by the SBU, the Ukrainian Security Service, um, together with Azov, uh, Azov Battalion uh, at the Mariupol airport. It was a black site, an unofficial prison, where they stored um, books. Books was what they called citizens suspected of separatism, um, opposition activists, pro-Russian activists, and uh, it was a very gruesome place. It was uh, like refrigerated cells without any furniture, uh, sealed doors, and just like you imagine a torture prison from a movie, really. Like, absolutely disgusting. And um, so, yeah, they ran that prison, basically, until the city was uh, taken by Russian forces. Yes, and um, of course, you were pretty young when it all happened. Despite 100% of all people in Mariupol speaking Russian, I think that the self-identification was different. And some Russian speakers started uh, identifying themselves as Ukrainian. What would you say was the percentage of people who would identify as Ukrainian? Mm, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20 percent of people who... I'm speaking about people who supported Ukraine and wanted to be separated from Russia because uh, many pro-Russian people are also identifying themselves as Ukrainian, but like me, I don't even have opinion who am I because Mm -hmm. my family is Ukrainian. And I have Ukrainian accent, Ukrainian surname, but at the same time, I'm considering myself Russian. So it's uh, hard to say yeah. who is Russian and who is Ukrainian. Who, Ukrainian. And about uh, self-identifying, uh, most of people were Russian. Yeah, but given that the, there was a battalion that was kidnapping people for being proactively Russian, it was probably not very popular. Like, they they were Russian, but they were a bit ashamed of it, maybe. But let's uh, talk about actually some good things. I think there were some. Uh, For example, what about the salaries? And did they grow after 2014? For example, your father, who who worked at the steel plant, or 
probably still does. I'm not sure. You will tell us about it. So what about the salaries of average Mariupol citizens? Mm, to be honest, I don't really know because mm. back then I wasn't interested in that. We, My father got enough on Ilicha still plant. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's all I know about that time. And... Uh, Ilyich still plans uh, survived the, the battle for Mariupol, right? Mm, not really. It was uh, almost destroyed. Uh, but unlike Azovstal, it will be repaired and uh, some parts of it are already working. Okay, I see. So does he work there or you know, what is the situation with your family? Mm, I have only mother and she's still in Mariupol. And uh, recently you have visited some other places in the Donbass. Like I've seen your photo from Lugansk, right? Yes. And uh, so why did you travel? What uh, have you seen interesting in other cities of the Donbass? Mm, I traveled because I wanted to make video for my channel and also mm-hmm. it was summer, I had plenty of time and I was a little bit bored. Uh, so Lugansk for me is like the most alive city in mm-hmm all new territories because Mariupol was destroyed and now it's revived and in some places in Mariupol you can see that it's a little bit artificial because in some places people are still didn't return yeah and Lugansk is just undamaged city and it living without war shellings ended two years ago and shellings weren't that significant as street fightings so Lugansk is very alive city and Berdyansk. I also was in Berdyansk, the Prozhia Oblast. It's also uh, very, how to say it? Peaceful. Uh, yes, peaceful uh, because it was taken without any blood, without any mm-hmm. killings. And uh, despite some people are left Berdyansk and moved to U- Europe or Ukraine, most of people are returning and even businesses are returning and cafes and entertainments are opening, reopening there. Yeah, great. And what about the, the rate of return to Mariupol? Uh, how many of your friends and uh, people that you know return to the city? Most of people who currently live in city are returned. Very few stayed. Even I uh, moved to Donetsk when in April 2022 and I mm-hmm. returned after two months. And most of people in Mariupol are people who returned from Europe, from Russia, very few from Ukraine because Ukraine has closed borders. Yeah. And people are still returning. So jumping a little bit ahead, but uh, uh, what uh, happened to you, the apartment in Mariupol that you lived in uh, before the SMO? I was really lucky and it's undamaged. Hmm. Shells hit nearby, like a few meters uh, away from it. Uh, but everything except glasses are completely undamaged. Were you happy about it? Or in retrospect, maybe now you would want a newer apartment <laughs> or uh, the older one is just fine and it's better that way? It's my apartment and I'm very happy that it didn't oh. suffer. Damage. Yeah, forgive me yeah. for my cynic <laughs> cynicism. Yeah, and it's not that common. Shall we make a li- little recap how it all happened? So the SMO was declared, and uh, in March, the Russian forces encircled the city. Uh, Kirill, do you remember the exact chronology? I remember. Mm, yes, I think um, March 2nd, the city was fully surrounded when the troops that came from the DPR linked up with the troops that came from Crimea through Berdyansk. From then on, the Russian forces started pushing into the city itself. And uh, that's also when the... I think on March 7, uh, they started um, the evacuation of civilians with the humanitarian corridors and such. Uh, yes, Nikolai, what was the situation like in, on March the 2nd? How did people react, basically? Mm, everything started in March the 2nd. Uh, we got electricity disabled and we lost everything except for gas. We still had gas before 8th of March. And uh, we just lived without any communication with other world. So only rumors. Uh, what Would was you the... use the basement when the shelling was intense? I didn't use the basement because I just didn't see any sense. And mm. 
I know that basement isn't a safe place and you can be heated there too. You can be buried by the, uh, the yes, fallen yes. apartment, uh, yeah, on your head, basically. At least in an apartment, it's not so stressful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you want to tell us in which rayon of Mariupol you lived? Or? Central district and ah, Dessel. Central. Mm-hmm. What was the initial reaction that people had when the uh, special military operation was declared? Mm. What was what, what? What did you think uh, about it? I was uh, pro-Russian even before war, so mm-hmm. for me it was like, okay, it will end fast, and we will live better. And I thought that maybe Ukrainians will try to defend Mariupol and turn it into Stalingrad, but then I thought that, no, it will not happen. Everything will be like in Crimea. And mm. uh, But it's my reaction because I was pro-Russian and mm-hmm. I think I, I was mistaken. Yeah. And some of my friends uh, who pro who weren't, I think, who are pro-Ukrainian, and they wanted the city uh, to not surrender, to defend at any cost. Uh, I think they're very stupid. Yes. How did you leave Mariupol? How did that happen, the evacuation? Uh, my relatives from Donetsk, uh, how, how to say it, asked for evacuation for me, and uh, soldiers just uh, took us, me and my mom, to Donetsk, where we have apartment. Was there a distinction in attitude towards uh, Russian troops and the Donetsk rebels? Mm, excuse me, I forgot what distinction means. Разница. I mean, uh, uh, y- yes, yeah. yes, uh, because Russian forces and especially Chechen forces, they were better equipped and mm-hmm. more professionals. And in Donetsk uh, militia, there were people who were mobilized a few days before. Mm-hmm. They had worse equipment and... But I mean, the attitude of the fighters, because for Russian troops, or especially for the Chechen troops, Mariupol is a very distant and unknown land. And for Donetsk uh, militia, it's uh, their city that they always considered a part of the Donetsk People Republic. And it is now. Uh, and they were familiar with it. And some of them, even had relatives living in Mariupol and that they were separated with for uh, years, right? So it was a different situation for them to go to fight for Mariupol. I almost didn't interact with Chechen and uh, Russian soldiers, only with the uh, Donetsk people, Republic uh-huh. militia, and uh, DPR soldiers are, they really, uh, as you said, it's their home. In fact, most of them were visited Mariupol before 20. 20- Uh, 14 events and mm-hmm. yes they were really friendly and i only heard about chechen soldiers that uh, they are also nice guys just uh, usual soldiers not assholes and uh, not angels they just just soldiers i remember a video um was an interview with people from mariupol they were sitting in a basement And they were giving an interview to, to Russian journalists. And uh, it was very funny uh, when they said, like, oh, and then uh, we saw soldiers walking outside and they were yelling, Allahu Akbar. And then we knew these are our guys. These are Russians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that even before the war, you were pro-Russian. So uh, how did you come to the pro-Russian views and when did it happen? Mm, it happened maybe half of a year before war because I studied, mm-hmm. his- I learned history. It was boring summer and uh, I just uh, learned history and I understood that Mariupol is a Russian city and also about uh, 2014 events, about conflict in Donbass and I understood who Who is the right side? Yeah. Did you lose any friends because of the political debates? Yes. Some of my classmates, we stopped uh, to interact because they are in Kiev or in other Ukrainian cities. Someone is in Europe and uh, I am a traitor for them. So, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, living in such a bubble and closed-off society when uh, the Russian language uh, was removed from the schools, well, for a few years, and um, it, it takes an extra step to uh, actually come to the opposing views, to the status quo, and it's not easy to do, and it takes a lot of uh, good literature to do it. 
probably. But also you said that uh, some of your uh, acquaintances uh, went to Europe. And uh, I know one story of uh, one Mariupol girl who would uh, go uh, evacuate from Mariupol to Russia and then from Russia because she didn't like it for political reasons she would uh, go to the Baltics and then extract it to France. And uh, what was the typical route for those Mariupol citizens who ended up in Europe to go there? Same route through Taganrog, uh, then through Baltic to Europe. Oh, so they all went to Russia and then to Europe? Mm, not all. Of course. Mm, some go, went uh, through Turkey. And also oh. around 50% of my people I knew stayed in Russia in different cities. Well, yeah, it it would be the logical step to stay in Russia. But what is the most popular EU country, European country that uh, they are now living in? Some of them. Mm, do. Germany or maybe Austria. I see. Uh, but you're not in contact with them anymore and you don't really know if they like it there or not. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so let me read some uh, questions. There are quite a bit of them sent to us. Um, Peter wants to know, what is one thing you would tell or show the average American about life in Mariupol to make them understand why people there are pro-Russian? Well, that's the question mm. from Peter, I guess. I think uh, I would show the moments from March 2022, when everything already went wrong, we had no electricity, any, we hadn't any communication, and Ukraine didn't do anything to us, not a bread, nothing. And uh, Russia immediately, after liberation of few first districts, quarters, started to uh, open the center of humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could got a mobile SIM card there, not not only food, not only water, uh, you could uh, take a bath there and Russia really cared about us, despite it was hard to organize such a thing because uh, there were dozens of thousands of Mariupol citizens from different districts, uh, but still uh, Russia really tried to save us. I've heard some stories about the AFU and Azov soldiers uh, just uh, getting into people's apartments and uh, using them as uh, firing spots uh, and basically stealing other people's property. Did you hear anything of the sort? Yes, uh, it's a fact. And I know a few buildings, mostly they occupied uh, 14 hours, 14 floor buildings and... Uh, I know a few places, yes, where they just uh, kicked people out of apartments and, yes. Mariupol is beautiful, it's not a question. Um, please ask him if he has footage of the maternity hospital number three in Mariupol or, or what is the current status of it? Mm, it wasn't repaired and to be honest, I have no idea why because it's in the center and Russia repairing Russia even repaired a clinic nearby, but when I uh, was there last time, uh, it uh, wasn't touched, so it's still destroyed. Yeah, and we will talk uh, about the reconstruction and all that. The, uh, and there was a weird uh, question or insinuation. Uh, let me read it. Uh, I have a friend who is from Eastern Ukraine, Dnipro, and he grew up speaking Russian still speaks Russian with friends and family. When he was 18, he moved to St. Petersburg for six years. Uh, I showed him uh, your channel, videos from Mariupol, to get his thoughts. He was particularly interested in the video on the channel that was uh, you, Nikolai, speaking Russian and not English. And I asked him why. He said that uh, there is a very evident, distinctive accent between native-born Ukrainians who grew up speaking Russian compared to the accent of native-born Russians. He said that uh, the kid's accent is very suspicious and sounds more like someone who was born in Russia. Also note, uh, 
yeah, we are not uh, pro-Ukrainian, da, 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 da. but uh, yeah, and he wants to know why don't you have a Ukrainian accent or maybe your secret Russian from Russia? It's very strange because uh, a few days ago I rewatched some of my old talking videos and I can clearly hear how I uh, pronounce like uh, G sound, like I'm pronouncing it like a uh huh, and it's only Ukrainian and maybe also uh, southern Russian cities uh, has such a pronunciation. This is suspicious. Да что ты говоришь? Половина Воронежа говорит так. Uh, what about other things uh, aside from the sound that are distinctive about the well Ukrainian accent or Mal Russian accent? I don't really know any other differences. Maybe pronunciation of some words. Yes. Yeah, sure. And uh, the intonation is a bit different. Also, I find that it's a bit more humorous in a way, less serious than the Russian intonation of the sentence. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on that, but uh, especially in Kiev, Ky Kiev ones are also Russian speakers. Well, they used to be like uh, all of the people living in Kiev uh, spoke Russian, but uh, it, would, it was a bit of a different uh, cadence and vibe to, to their speech. It's a bit more hood and uh, at the same time, <laughs> a bit more humorous, yes. you know, and uh, like in, in this as well. And more sure, sure. yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I quite like actually the, the Ukrainian accent uh, in the Russian language. It's a uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, part of the culture, part of the overall culture. Oh, I have actually a question. I, I actually have a question about that. So, uh, when I was in Odessa in 2016, um, one thing that I noticed was that when talking about money about prices for something like i don't know okay. when i will when i would get a pack of cigarettes or whatever um everyone every single person uh, i ever bought something from uh called the money not grivne but rubli in everyday life uh did they do that in mariupol as well uh yes and i remember it from my childhood and i asked mm -hmm. my parents why ruble if grivna and it's because people just remember Soviet yeah. times and our yeah. past. Yeah, there is an insane uh, conspiracy theory that is popular in the Russian regions of the Ukraine, like Odessa, some parts of uh, Donetsk, I guess, uh, like Mariupol and other places, that um, uh, when a young guy living in Odessa, for example, is conflicted, why is he speaking Russian? when he is pro-Ukrainian. He doesn't like Russian Federation, he hates Putin and uh, everything that Russian Federation has to represent. And still, he doesn't know much of the Ukrainian language and his native tongue is Russian and he's uh, practically identical to Russians. And uh, when asked about it, he would say, well, uh, you see, um, actually, ancient people in Odessa, pre-Soviet times, we all spoke Ukrainian. And the evil Soviets forced everyone to learn Russian and, uh, yeah, use rubles and whatnot. And because of the 70 years of the Soviet period, people were reprogrammed to become Russians. Have you heard any uh, such theories uh, espoused by people in Mariupol or elsewhere in the Ukraine? Mm, I heard uh, such stories, but mostly in the internet. And mm. as I researched, I think the opposite happened because Bolsheviks uh, tried to Ukra Ukrainianize land. And uh, there were Ukrainian language exams in 13th of the uh, past century. So I think the, the opposite happened. Yeah, it's the eternal debate. And of course, uh, there are many documents proving that Ukrainization or Karenization was going on rapidly in most of the Ukraine. Pro well, I guess the only uh, fact that I would give to the uh, rabid Ukrainian nationalist is that it's true that uh, due to internal migration, there were a lot of transplants from Ukraine, uh, from the Soviet Ukraine to uh, Soviet Russia and vice versa. So some people from Tambov would uh, go to work in some steel plant in uh, Krivoy Rok, for example. Of course, it was uh, basically the same country, 
why wouldn't they? But yeah, it was also going on. And uh, as to our um, discussion of your accent, can you pronounce this famous uh, shibboleth word, uh, Polyanitsya or whatever? <laughs> Polyanitsya. Okay, Ukrainian Ukrainians in the audience, you be the judge <laughs> if it was the, the right pronunciation. Yeah, uh, do people actually say it? Is it a real word uh, that people use in everyday life? Maybe not in Mariupol, but in the rest of Ukraine. Uh, yes, it means buchanka. I don't know uh -huh. how is it in English. Piece of bread? Mm -hmm. Yeah, loaf of bread, yes. something. It's interesting. It's actually interesting because my wife is from Odessa, born and raised, and she had never heard that word before 2022. Before, uh, but I also have a friend from um, Rostov Oblast. And he said that it's a normal water, and they all use it. So yeah, it's. So, have you personally used this word in, in the in the shop or elsewhere? Uh, I spoke Russian everywhere, but in the shop when you're buying bread, uh, it's titled on a pack. Ah, I see. Mm. Yeah, that's how people are. Yeah, it was popularized, I guess. All right, uh, let me see some other questions. Um, Oh, yeah. A great question. Uh, Russia reconstructed Mariupol? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, let's talk about the reconstruction efforts and when they started and uh, uh, what is the, yeah, the state of Mariupol right now? What, uh, what percentage of the city was rebuilt and what wasn't? Uh, I'll start from, it started in 2022 in autumn, late autumn after the referendum. And uh, speaking about percentage, which is now done, it's hard to say because private sector, like one floor private buildings, are still mostly destroyed and very few are repaired. But at the same time, uh, an apartment buildings, uh, they all, if not repaired, but at least some works uh, were done everywhere. Heavily damaged were demolished and uh, slightly damaged uh, were repaired and there is no apartment buildings i think which uh, their works didn't uh, start i see and what is the portrait of an average worker is it a tajiki man there are many local men oh. but uh, i think yes uh, there are more central asia workers yeah and some locals uh, because yeah it's also a job that pays pretty well actually and uh, the job situation right now what is the most typical job in mariupol right now uh, on reconstruction uh, different uh, jobs on uh, construction sites and repairing buildings and you can also like uh, work in service i guess in uh, municipal transport or in shops and uh, etc but uh, there are there is very bad situation for qualified uh, specialists because if you are mm -hmm. an engineer you can work on a uh, construction works but if you are it specialist uh, mm -hmm. programmer or some kind of economist then it's no way to work uh, with a specialty well yeah only for some other city i guess right yeah from your home for some moscow firm I see. Are you in education right now? I'm studying. And what do you want to become? A uh, web programmer, I think. Oh, I see. And what is your general plan for the future? To stay in Mariupol or go elsewhere? I don't know. I'll decide it after I finish. I'll finish my study. Yeah. Maybe. Fair I, I like the idea of staying in Mariupol because I like the city. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also want to live in Moscow for a couple of years. I don't want to live there for all my life, but I want to try to live in Moscow. Yeah. So we'll see. Sure. Uh, what about the uh, seaside property? Is it being bought by the Moscow tycoons right now? Yes. <laughs> Is it bad? Are the prices soaring higher and higher? Yes, prices are very high because... <laughs> it's a really profitable place in the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. There's going to be so much money on the Mariupol seaside. So we, we are already late to the party. It's over. I can never afford buying a <laughs> dacha on the sea. It's terrible. No, it is what it is. But uh, it's still lower than in Crimea and other places, right? What is the typical price uh, for a plot of land 
a modest plot of land and a house near mm, the I sea. I don't really, but it gets more expensive with every, every single month. day. Oh, and yeah. I, I know that in 2022 it was almost free mm -hmm. because Damn. even before Mariupol joined Russia. Uh, but now I just, uh, I don't really know current situation uh, so, in, in numbers, but it's no way to afford it. Yeah, so locals are not enthusiastic about the high prices for real estate. They hate it, right? Mm, I guess so. Uh -huh. So th that's the major downside. Well, of course, the fierce battles that took place in Mariupol between AFU and Azov and uh, DPR and Russia uh, that left m most of the city destroyed. And now uh, it's been reconstructed by, on the downside, it's getting also more expensive. Something of the sort happened in Crimea without all the destructions. So they were the luckiest ones. Let me see some other questions. Um, El Punt, uh, thoughts on Russian liberals, like those who don't, do not recognize historical Russian territories. Do you think they're, they're foreign agents? That's a weird question. But yeah, uh, let's uh, talk a bit more abstract. What, is, what do you think about the internal Russian politics now that you are part of them and the, the war between... Uh, the various uh, factions of the liberals who uh, are now living abroad. Do you watch any, like Maxim Katz on YouTube <laughs> or other such figures? Mm, they are all traitors for me, and I think they are really foreign agent. But even if not, I don't even talk about this scam. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, that uh, Maxim saying, um do you have a, a, you probably do, do you have a Russian passport by now? Uh, yes, I got it uh, two years ago, mm. a little bit less, okay, in 2023. How did that work? Uh, like, um, how long did it take to get it? Mm, I don't remember, two or three weeks. It's mm. very easy mm -hmm. to get passport in Mariupol. Oh, that's good. That's very really good. Another question from Diesto. Uh, do you think that there was indeed an ideological void in Ukraine that nationalism happened to fill? I think yes, because people didn't care about politics at all in 2014. No one... I don't really remember even when I learned about that time because I was too young. Uh, but uh, there were never any, how to say it, political activists Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, there was there was a void, and they occupied it. Yeah, and um, of course the Russian soft power failed, and uh, after 2014 there was not not a single actual pro-Russian party aside from this Medvedchuk figure in Kiev, right? And uh, did you ever care for for Medvedchuk? <laughs> I know that. Uh... He is a man who failed all attempts to make Russia and Ukraine at least not enemies. So I don't want to answer this question. Okay. Um, what was it like in Donetsk when you left Mariupol? After Mariupol, it was like a paradise because in Mariupol, <laughs> we hadn't ever seen it. It was hell on earth. And in Donetsk, at least I had electricity and uh, some friends and despite there were shelling we had no water but then after two months in mariupol without electricity mm. it was uh, a best place for me but uh, if uh, if speaking object objectively uh, donetsk now is a very bad place to live in because there is still no water and uh, many people left despite now shellings are less intensive and it's more much more safe there uh, but still now many people left and uh, Donetsk is very sad place it's worse uh, would you say than Mariupol yes definitely hmm. for last year yeah it's, why do you think that there was there is more funding directed to Mariupol than to Donetsk from Russia uh, because before Avdeevka got uh, liberated Donetsk w was constantly shelled yeah, and uh, no repair works uh, could be done, and now it's much more safe, and at least 
I heard that uh, some building company already uh, funded uh, some mortgage apartment buildings in Donetsk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is a chance that Donetsk will also become a normal city uh, yeah, in the following years. Yeah, you have to consider that Donetsk is uh, still almost a frontline city. Of course, the FDF catch retina offensive helped a lot. And in that area, Donetsk is now like 40 kilometers from the front line. But on the other side, um, like the Kurachovka side, it's still only like 25 kilometers from the front lines. Uh, whereas Mariupol is now, how far it's... Uh, 100 yes, kilometers. It's, it's 100 kilometers from the front line. That's a big difference. Yeah, sure. And of course, it's, yeah, much, you... it's much safer to build in Mariupol, much safer to bring in people. Yeah, it's safer than Belgorod and uh, yeah, <laughs> because uh, the tube artillery cannot hit it. Yeah, yes. And also, yeah, I think uh, Moscow is secretly more interested uh, in Mariupol because it's uh, on the edge of sea, and yeah, Russians are crazy about sea. And yeah, I think the the long term plan for Mariupol is, which they said openly, is that like they are not going to rebuild Azovstal. Um, and mm. instead, they're they're gonna make a like a big park, I think, there and something. And uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of like parks and hotels and things like that in Mariupol in the long term future. Correct. It's gonna be a vacation city. Yeah, uh, there is a question about the Greek population in Mariupol. Do you know of any Greek families, or maybe uh, you were told by your grandma that the Greeks uh, used to live there? Personally, I don't know any Greeks, uh, but in local media, like in local Telegram channels, mm-hmm. yes, uh, there is a diaspora, and as I know, it completely supported Russia, and uh, there are some news that uh, they are organizing some events for ethnic Greeks, uh, but I'm not a Greek, and I don't have any Greek friends, so I know from it, uh, I know about it only from Telegram channels. Well, yeah, it's natural that the Greek community supported Russia for many reasons, uh, historical ones, and also the reason of uh, linguistic reason, because I would imagine they all spoke uh, a version of Pontic Greek and Russian. And learning some third language in the schools was a bit of a hassle for them, probably. All right. Um, There is an interesting question from um, Dave Wright. How do you deal with all the hateful comments under your videos? I don't really care about them. <laughs> I, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Most of people support me. That's the correct approach. Um, let's talk a bit more about March, uh, early March of 2022, when the internet was gone, electricity was gone, and uh, it's uh, really the end of the world for in modern cities because it's all dependent on uh, those things uh, so what was the plan and what was people doing to to cook food and uh, get supplies and whatnot uh, people were trying to survive and uh, my family me and my mom we were really lucky because our uncle from Donetsk advised us to make a water supply uh, mm-hmm. supply how to say it's a pass Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Reserve, Uh, reserve, water reserve. And uh, we had uh, this reserve, we had uh, water maybe before April, like two or three weeks, most dangerous weeks. And other people uh, had to melt snow and collect uh, water from rain, from pools, and Uh. and it's terrible. And about food, uh, we also had a little reserve of food, uh, but also... Uh, most of people uh, took food from shops because there there were no security, no police. Yeah. So in fact, it's looting, but it's to save your life. And uh, we almost uh, didn't take part in this because we had the reserve. And what kind of reserves did you have? Like pickles in the jars or canned food and uh, many like rice. Damn, it's hard to say it in English. Uh, Скажи по-русски. Это проблема слушателя, что они не понимают. Окей, okay. <laughs> в холодильнике было замороженное сало. Mm-hmm. И, в принципе, в морозилке. Uh, много было такого, оно долго не размораживалось, потому что на улице было холодно, отопления не было. And yeah. also neighbors, our neighbors uh, 
shared with us uh, what they took from shops. So uh, were you actually preparing for the, the reserves because uh, of the uh, no. the war started or just you happened to have them? Okay, because I don't have any reserves at all. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. We made it because uh, 24th of February shops still were opened and mm-hmm. 25th, so you had like two days. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was enough to buy some canned food. And I see. Uh, yeah, it was incredibly cold. Uh, it was uh, probably one of the coldest uh, months of March in Mariupol in the recent history, right? Yes, we had snow in the end of March, and uh, that's yeah. I never this remember. This is uncommon, such... right? It Very. is common where I live. Uh, I live in the Urals, but uh, yeah, for Mariupol, it probably was a novelty. Mariupol and... is on the seashore, so usually we don't have snow even at winter, and this time in March. Yeah, very interesting. But yeah, it was very not ideal for for the citizens to survive in the cold. Yeah. So, and how long did you spend in the, this situation, and until you were evacuated? I was uh, evacuated in twenty fourth, wait, twenty seconds of April. So almost two months I spent in mm-hmm. Mariupol. Mm-hmm. What about? Uh, Well, there were terrible stories about um, grandmas and grandpas who uh, were dying, not even because of the shells, but because of their health reasons and the hospitals were shut down. Uh, Did you experience any of that? Fortunately, I didn't experience, but I know many people who experienced. Well, I I, I mean, uh, did you see anyone on the streets, any corpses? Mm, There were seven graves near my apartment building in my neighborhood yeah but uh, yeah the water reserves uh, are probably the the most important thing that you you need to have aside from canned food and actually uh, i have a question if uh, what was the situation in the suburbs of mariupol compared to the central part of the city um it's much safer because ukraine didn't try to hold them mm-hmm. and they are undamaged or at least very uh, hardly damaged, like Sartana and Mangush, private sector on the outskirts. So I guess uh, in the private sector, the situation is a bit different. Most people didn't even leave or did they leave and return? It's only uh, only on the outskirts because in the center and especially in Primorsky district, uh, Azov used uh, people's houses as a basis yeah. and because of that, uh, because of this, uh, private sector is destroyed and still didn't reconstruction didn't start there. Yeah, what was the general attitude of a commoner uh, when it all started? Was uh, I mean, it was uh, very disputed. Who who is in the wrong here? Of course, Russia attacked. Right, it's the natural reaction to not be crazy and happy that uh, your city is attacked by. Well, uh, another power. And uh, so was there a shift in the anti-Russian sentiments uh, when it all started? Mm, I don't know. I mm, conversated only with two of my pro-Ukrainian, uh, they were friends and that, at that moment. And they were just brainwashed from Telegram. And as I know, most of people just stayed neutral. And uh, like, you know, like from that uh, joke, our Sawinian and who are ours? Those who are winning. Yeah. And that's about us. And of course, people all of were, us. Yeah, some people were mad that uh, they were kicked out of their apartments and the firing nests were in the. As you said, uh, were there any 14 stories uh, buildings in Mariupol? I mean, is it 14 uh, floor building, not 16 like in the rest of uh, the. F- I think, yes, uh, 14, I know couple hmm. of them and I was in one of them I never found seen there. a 14 floor building actually it's uh, it's usually either well in Russia the historical Russia it's either 9 floor or 16 floor 14 is a novelty to me but yeah it's still a high rise are they the, the tallest uh, buildings in Mariupol mm, the tallest buildings uh, there are a couple of them in the center we have uh, Gipramies but I, I don't know 
how many floors are there, but it's very high and you can mm -hmm. see it from almost any part of the city. And we also have big church, Sabor. It's also very big and you can also see it from afar. And when it all was uh, dwindling down and the rest of the Azov battalion was hiding in the caves under the, the factory, uh, under the Azov, Azov style factory, uh, did the attitude change? Uh, well, uh, you, you uh, like, uh, what was their solution? Because there was a protracted period of time, like two or three weeks, where it was undecided because there were still some Azov guys uh, under the ground, basically. And uh, what was the the idea of the average uh, Mariupol citizen? Did they want them to leave or to surrender? Uh, we hated them, most of us. Even yeah. many pro-Ukrainians uh, changed their opinion because because they really used us as life shield. And uh, most of us really wanted them, how to say it? I think you got me. Yeah. Well, drowned. Uh, I think there was a, uh, the idea to drown them in uh, feces uh, or something like that uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. when they were hiding exactly. uh, under the ground. Yeah. But I've heard some uh, theories that some of them or other AFU, or especially the h officials, uh, were extracted by helicopters from the city when it all started. Uh, have you heard anything about the Ukrainian helicopters rescuing some top mm, officials? I don't know. I. I live in afar from Azovstal, and I never heard even such rumors, so no well, idea. Yeah, I'm not even talking about the Azov, uh, but uh, yeah, city in administration. general. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe yeah, city that. administration evacuated uh, by trains in first days of ah. war, and I no. just want to remind you that no one of citizens were evacuated, mm -hmm. uh, but of course, city major immediately left to Kiev with his family. Yeah, well, considering the situation in Kursk, and of course, it's a very different situation because the town of Suja is much, much smaller than Mariupol, but still the administration of Suja also did the same and they evacuated before any citizens and they didn't even try. So, yeah, really brother nations. <laughs> <laughs> but at least there is evacuation for citizens in Suja and... Of course, yeah, there, it was there were, uh, done. There was made, no evacuation yeah. for Mariupol citizens at all. Yeah, but so I mean, the, the scammy administration figures are pretty ah, much the identical. Course. But of course, yeah, the <laughs> it's a bit different still. All right, uh, let me see some a few remaining questions and uh, we can wrap it up. Uh, have you ever been to Kiev, actually? Yes, I was in uh, 2019 and I like the city. Sure. Uh, despite no now I understand that uh, it's a good city, uh, but still many Russian cities like like even Rostov on Don is uh, mm -hmm. developed the same on the same level or even better. So it, uh, it's far from Kiev to Moscow, you know, uh, but yeah. still a nice city and I like, uh, I enjoyed that, that trip. Yeah, of course. There is a difference. I think Kiev was much greater than Rostov-on-Don back in the day. Uh, well, there, there is a subway system and uh, whatnot. And nowadays it, uh, it was dropping in quality and uh, because of the lack of renovation, lack of any metro stations <laughs> there was a zero of them built in the whole period of independence and other stuff that uh, wasn't fixed but yeah i would uh, also want to go there one day never had the pleasure um what do you think about the presence of a lot of aliens there who came there from russia that that aliens. are not russian uh, that's what, what do you mean? It, it's uh, the, about uh, Central Asia, like Tajiks yes, and other. All right. So, what is your opinion on Tajiks? <laughs> I, that's a problem because they have higher crime, crime rate. And, well, I think, I, I hope uh, when they f will finish the reconstruction, they will go home. They will, <laughs> because uh, what's there to do for them? Uh, they are only interested in construction and other such jobs uh, and uh, yeah i don't i don't think that they're to stay i would like to hear your opinion on the prospects of uh, pacifying different parts of ukraine 
I'm particularly interested in Northwest Ukraine versus Galicia versus Transcarpathia. Seems to me that maybe Northwestern Ukraine, which was in the Russian Empire, might be more amenable to Russia than Galicia. Also interesting that Transcarpathia voted with Southern Ukraine in elections. What do you think about the various regions of Western Ukraine? I don't really know. The only thing I can say is that uh, they are really different from us. And I even conversated with one of Ukrainians from Lvov. He mm -hmm. is a very sane person and uh, Ukrainian language is his native. And we are really different uh, nationalities with them. Like guy from Lvov and guy from Donbass, we are different. And uh, that's all I can say because I never was there. And uh, I had very few interaction with people from there. Yeah. And what about the aspects of Ukrainian culture, modern Ukrainian culture that you enjoy, maybe to this day or you used to, maybe some Ukrainian rock bands or TV shows or whatever? Mm, I think uh, not, there is nothing because, okay, I maybe I listened to a couple of songs in Ukrainian, but uh, I don't, uh, I can't say that I'm enjoying Ukrainian culture because <laughs> I'm mostly on Russian. Yeah, sure. I've enjoyed some rock band from Lvov, not Ekean Elzi, but another one. I seem to uh, forgot what they were called. Uh, but yeah, it was a fun band. And uh, the, the frontman was, the, well, he mysteriously died in 2015. And he was against the uh, war in Donbass. No idea. Yeah, you're really not that much of a Ukrainian after all. Uh, <laughs> That's great to hear. And I guess, yeah, that's the final question. Could one speak openly about one's opinions among co-workers, uh, fellow students, neighbors, or even family? Is it is it really difficult to do so? Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure what he means by that, but... Uh, I think yeah. he's about asking about free speech. And, yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, is there more mm -hmm. or less free speech now that uh, Mariupol is uh, part of Russia? Uh, well, I in my last gra uh, class of school, I changed uh, school, and in both schools, I had a, I, I knew one pro Ukrainian guy, and he spoke uh, about it without a fear, and nothing happened with them. Uh, it's two guys, and. Uh, but they planned to leave Mariupol and go to Kiev or to Lvov, to West. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, both are already left to Kiev or whatever, wherever else. Uh, but uh, about more adult uh, people, I didn't really know. People are really careful. And I never heard about uh, cases when someone got imprisoned or punished for opinion. Yeah, the it's idea. Hard question. I, I just never interacted with uh, such people. All of uh, people I am talking and connecting with are pro Russian or neutral. So I don't think I can answer this question. Yeah, I think for a young guy to go from Mariupol right now to Kiev is one of the dumbest ideas. Uh, yeah, of course, because of the mobilization. Uh, uh, one, of this, uh, one of them was really an asshole and uh, he planned to join army. So I uh, know, have no idea what happened to him. <laughs> well, yeah. It's been two years. Yeah. F in the chat or... <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I actually remember it, uh, the name of the band. Uh, it's Skrebin. It, it was on the right it. Ukrainian uh, rock uh, group. Yeah, nothing special, but uh, considering the, the origin, it's pretty good. All right. Well, if that's all that we wanted to discuss, or do you have any other hot takes on the matter or some other matters that you will, would like to speak uh, on to, please do. Or Kirill, are you out of questions as well? Yeah, I think we covered pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, thanks. Спасибо, Николай, что пришел к нам на наше маленькое шоу и рассказал нам, как какова жизнь в Мариуполе на самом деле. Thank you all for listening and see you very soon.